Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, how is your journey going this morning with the Lord Jesus? Do you find yourself on a mountaintop? Are you resting in the flower-filled valleys? Or are you walking through dark places? You see, our Christian life is like that of the seasons of the earth. Sometimes it's springtime. Everything is fresh and alive. Sometimes it's summer. We're just enjoying ourselves in the beauty that God has bestowed upon us and around us. And then sometimes we're going through winter where old things must die, must pass away in order to bring new life. So if you're going through these dark experiences, these cold experiences, the winter season of your spiritual life, remain steadfast, friends, knowing that spring is just around the corner. And what you're going through serves a very divine purpose. And even in these dark and cold and lonely places, lift your hands unto the God whom you serve and sing from the bottom of your heart, rejoicing with praise that only he is worthy of. And do one more thing. If you're on the mountaintop, if you're even sitting in the valley and the meadow and enjoying all the beauty and splendor that are around you, Offer a prayer for those who are going through these dark and lonely times. Even if you don't know them, whisper a simple prayer that God will be near them, will comfort them, and will equip them with endurance so that they can remain faithful during these difficult days that they're experiencing. Now we're continuing our study through the book of Romans, and today we find ourselves in a bit of a controversial passage. Not simply controversial because people debate over it, but controversial because so many people practice it and find themselves guilty. And yet the warning, as we're going to see, is very dire, even using the word damnation. And so it's a passage that we should give very much attention to. And we need to bring ourselves under the subjection of the authority of God's rule and not allow ourselves to participate in such things ever again. Now, from a contextual perception, we have to understand that Paul is writing to the Roman Jewish Christian believers. And these believers are under the rule of the Roman government. And when you take any two opposing forces, there seems to be a conflict. The natural way is that of resistance against those who are opposing us. But as we know, as followers of Jesus, we're not to oppose them, resist them, or we could even say rebel against them because rebellion comes from the heart of the enemy. We are to surrender to them and even more to love them with the love of Jesus our master. And so having that in mind, let's begin in Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. Now Paul says, let every soul, let every single one of you who call yourselves followers of the Lord Jesus be subject, become the servant of, even the slave of, those who are in higher powers. For there is no single power but of God. The powers that be are ordained, or they're placed by, or they're appointed by God. Now, whosoever, if any one of you, therefore resist, stands against, rebels against that power, you are resisting, you are standing against, you are rebelling against God himself. Because as we read in verse 1, God is the one who's placed them in those seats of authority whether they're right, whether they're wrong, whether they're followers of Jesus or whether they're sinners, whether they're holy or whether they're pagan. God has placed each one there by his own authority. And so to resist them is to resist the ordinance of God. 
or the appointment of God. And then notice what it says, because this is a severe warning that we need to heed, friends. It says, those that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, not blessing, not favor, not approval from God, but they will receive damnation. And so Paul, wishing to explain himself, says, look, rulers are not a terror to good works. If you're doing what's right, you have nothing to fear. But if you're doing wrong, you have everything to fear because these rulers are placed there to keep us in line. So do that which is good, and you will have praise of the same. For the one placed in that seat of authority is the minister of God. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid. Because the one in authority does not bear the sword in vain, for he again is the minister of God, and he is there to act with justice and execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So in understanding this, it's important for you to be subjected to them, to be subservient to them, to realize their authority, to humble yourself under their authority, and do all that they ask of you as long as it doesn't oppose the rule of God. In other words, if they were to ask you to burn your Bibles, stop praying, stop speaking in the name of the Lord Jesus, these things you should never do because it's better to obey God than to obey man. But as long as they don't oppose the rule of God, then we are to be subject unto them. Now let's pause for just a moment and this, let's dissect this. Because if we truly, from our hearts, place ourselves in a place of subjection under them, in our hearts now, that means our heart is going to remain in a state of peace. We're not going to become angry against them. We're not going to rebel against them. And we're not going to defy them in any way. Now, this would be our political leaders. This would be our church leaders. This would be our bosses, our parents all those who are placed in authority over us. But think about that for a moment. If our heart is truly in a humble, kneeled, bowing place, recognizing their authority, would we ever speak against them? And yet how many people call themselves Christians and attack so viciously with their tongue the leaders that have been set above us? How many speak so negatively against Obama or Bush when he was in office or even today Trump? If you're a Republican, how often do you speak evil negatively about the Democrats? If you're a Democrat, how negatively, how often do you speak evil against those who are Republican? And that's just a small example. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen people who say they love the Lord Jesus deeply. And yet, if you look at their Facebook posts, they're so opposed to this passage of Scripture because they're doing the very thing that this Scripture warns against. Well, let's continue in verse 6. For this reason, pay you tribute also. Now, this isn't only talking about monetary tribute, but it's talking about lip service because they are God's ministers, and they are attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything. Give everyone the credit that they deserve. For if they hold that office, most likely it wasn't just handed to them, They had to work very hard, even though you may disagree with them, they had to work very hard to get to where they are. And so that in and of itself demands honor. And love them from the depths of your heart. Love them and honor them, knowing that God is the one that has placed them there. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. That's why we were given the commandments in verse 9. And all of the commandments can be wrapped up into loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, the first four commandments, and the last six commandments, love your neighbor as yourself. Love doesn't work ill to his neighbor in verse 10. Love doesn't speak evil against another. And you, knowing the time, 
knowing that Jesus is going to return, you should be waking out of your sleep. You should not be behaving in such a manner. For if you truly believe the Lord Jesus was coming today, how differently would you speak about these people? So in verse 12, cast off the works of darkness. You see, when we operate in such a way, when we conduct ourselves in such a way, when we are in opposition to those who are placed in these seats of authority, we are standing on the side of darkness. But let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. Rioting simply means given to wild parties. Drunkenness would be excessive drinking. Let us not be found in chambering and wantonness. Chambering would be burning, lustful passions. And wantonness is in living a life with no restraint. Anything goes. And sometimes the thing that is going faster than anything else is our tongue. And we need to restrain our tongues. He continues, don't walk in strife or contention and debate and envying one another, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. Now notice the context again is opposition to those who are in the seat of authority. And it is linked with darkness and the flesh. And so Paul says, make no provision for the flesh. Don't allow yourself to behave in such a way. Do you remember in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, where Peter is speaking about the unjust, the ungodly? And he says in verse 10, chiefly those that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous or, or daring, audacious, arrogant are they. They are self-willed doing is speaking what they want to do, what they want to speak. And they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas the angels of God, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Even the most holy angels, the most mighty of angels, dare not speak against those whom God has placed in authority. In Jude, verse 8, it says, These ungodly are filthy dreamers. They defile the flesh. They despise dominion. And they speak evil of dignities. But Michael, the greatest angel, the mightiest angel of all, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil over the body of Moses, would not place himself in a position to speak against the devil any railing accusations. But he said, the Lord rebuked thee. It's interesting how among the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, you see everyone running around rebuking the devil in Jesus' name. Friends, that's nowhere in the Bible. We're no match for Lucifer, but we serve a God who is. We serve a God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has already triumphed over him. He is the captain of our souls. He is the great general in this army in which we serve. He goes before us. And we are not told to rebuke Satan. We're told to resist Satan. And if we resist him, he will flee from us. And so what we learn from this passage today is exactly what James told us in his letter. In chapter 3, verse 5, even so, the tongue is a little member, but it boasts great things. And how great a matter a little fire kindleth. How great damage the tongue of man does. Both in this world which we know, and even in the world that we don't know. Even in the spiritual realm, the tongue of man causes great conflict. It's a fire. It is a world of iniquity. It defiles the whole body and sets on fire the very course of nature. And it itself is set on fire of hell. Oh, friends, may God help us to be very careful what we say. 
And of course, as Jesus said, everything we say is a reflection of the heart. So even though there is a great problem with what comes out of our mouth, the true problem is within the heart. And if we get our hearts right with God, we'll have no desire to speak such evil things. So let us go humbly before the Lord, seeking forgiveness where we have broken these commands, where we have been guilty of speaking so foolishly. And then let us resolve within ourselves that we will not practice these things any longer, that we will place a guard upon our mouth and our prayer will be, as we talked about in yesterday's study on absolute surrender from Andrew Murray, our prayer will be, Lord God, not a word upon my tongue, but for thy glory. Not a movement of my temper, but for thy glory. Not an affection of love or hate in my heart, but for thy glory. And according to thy blessed will. Listen to that again, friend. Lord God, not a word upon my tongue, but for thy glory. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Let no corrupt, worthless, degrading, idle communication proceed out of your mouth. Only let come from your mouth that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. All oh, friends, may it be so. May we understand the importance of what God is teaching us here in chapter 13 of this great letter, the book of Romans. Now, before we leave today, friends, I want to leave you with a simple challenge. We have been talking about in our study the sacrifice, the offering that is required of our lives the things that we enjoy for the sake of Jesus. In chapter 12, we were told to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, the definition from Merriam-Webster's dictionary is an act of offering to a deity something precious that belongs to us. Well, I say this, friends, because tonight on televisions all across the world, many are going to be giving themselves to a championship football game. But I want to challenge you to forego watching this football game. Sacrifice it. Remember what a sacrifice is. An act of offering to a deity of something precious that belongs to you. And so I'm asking you on behalf of Jesus to sacrifice this football game tonight. Remembering what we are told in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, that we are to abstain from fleshly desires. And the only reason we would watch this football game is because our flesh is desiring it. And these desires war against our soul. Read the book of Romans instead. Read the book of John instead. You say that you love Jesus with your lips. Prove it by your actions sacrifice what you desire most this day for the sake of Jesus and watch what happens, friends. Well, I pray your journey will be blessed today, that your love for the Lord Jesus and his word will deepen and that you'll speak nothing at all unless it brings him glory, honor, and praise. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.